So the first question that we want to answer is, what is social media? You may have an intuitive feeling about social media based on your interactions online across a number of online platforms like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Foursquare, LiveJournal, etc. There are many platforms for posting social media or social networking sites or socially oriented content and interacting with your fellow users. But we want to have a an explicit definition of social media, we have to rely on, on something more definitive. So first off, let's talk a little bit about what media means. Uh, so in this case, we are referring to media as the plural of medium, as a means of affecting or conveyance, conveying something, or a channel or system of communication, information, or entertainment. This is as distinct from digital audio or video files that you might engage with on YouTube or on your phone or something like this uh, through Netflix. Specifically, we're looking at channels or systems of communication. Uh, this is what we refer to as media in the definition for social media. Now, as I mentioned in the kinds of social media platforms that you may already be familiar with, you have the, your social networking sites, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. You're already pretty familiar with these, but are these the whole space of social media platforms? And the answer is generally no. We refer to these as specifically social networking sites. We'll actually have a more explicit definition of what a social networking site is in a few minutes, but there are other social media platforms and channels and spaces as well. Things like Facebook, or excuse me, things like YouTube, Snapchat, WhatsApp, and Pinterest. Now these are all different, right? So Snapchat is, is distinct from the four main platforms that you may be familiar with or the more traditional sort of social networking sites that you that you may have used where Snapchat is maybe more private, it's less uh, broadcast, and it's more ephemeral. The message that you send or the image that you send is sort of designed to expire after a potentially short period of time, maybe 24 hours if you're using Snapchat stories. Again, this is all separate from WhatsApp where, again, you have a, a different kind of... of interaction. This is a more closed engagement. There's limits. You can have WhatsApp groups, but they're generally much, much smaller. In fact, they're limited uh, by design. They're generally private. This is separate from YouTube, which is much more video centric, has less of the social networking feel, uh, but is still all about broadcasting information or sharing information. In fact, it, content on YouTube now gets it's broken down, down into channels instead of just having videos. So you have channels of, of content on YouTube. And then Pinterest is, again, slightly different from everything else that we've talked about, where you are sharing links or curating these boards that then you f share with your friends or could be public uh, that all are grouped around some theme, uh, but aren't necessarily about building up a, a, a network of followings. So when we're trying to define social media, does is it enough to just say these online networking channels these kinds of of things that we've just discussed uh, but that leaves out things like reddit right so linkedin and facebook and twitter definitely have this networking structure pinterest has friend structures youtube has channels um, whatsapp and snapchat are definitely sort of this peer-to-peer -peer kind of, of, of platform where you're sharing content with friends or very specific groups of people. But Reddit's kind of different, right? So it's all about sharing links, which is similar to, to Pinterest as a community structure that maybe is more similar to YouTube channels, although YouTube channels are generally controlled by a single person. Uh, but it has no real, or for a long time, had no, no explicit user network. You wouldn't have friends on, on Reddit and you wouldn't necessarily follow individual accounts on Reddit. In fact, for a long time, I would say, and to some degree even now, the norm for the platform is you do not share your Reddit username, but you can still have these sort of anonymous uh, networks of interactions. But does this still count as social media? And I would say, I think pretty clearly it does. So it's not necessarily a social media, is, it's not enough to define it as a social networking site or a social networking channel. So if we get a little bit more broad, does this mean that we can say, so any sort of online web 2.0 sort of interactive space where people share content, is that social media? Well, if we're talking about just web 2.0, this sort of excludes older examples of social media. So things like IRC or bulletin board systems or Usenet, uh, that certainly were not web 2.0, but still were places where people would gather in sort of these social groups. Uh, you'd have uh, BBSs that were 
geared for specific communities or specific interests. Usenets and news groups had whole group designations and group hierarchies where people could come together and share information and engage and interact. So I'd say still these count as social media. So it's not a question of just new technology that enables you to engage that is sufficient for social media. Now, Wikipedia is kind of different, but it's still Web 2.0, right? So Web 2.0 kind of technology where people are going on, creating content on Wikipedia, updating information, sharing information through Wikipedia pages. But does it count as social media in a way that it would if we just defined all social media as just these online Web 2.0 kinds of uh, information sharing frameworks. I say probably Wikipedia is not social media. Uh, it's less about engagement. It's less about interaction. It's much more about uh, posting information or sharing information, but the social aspect isn't there as much. And what about GitHub? So GitHub is this online platform for communities to come together and develop pieces of software uh, through the Git revision control system. Again, it has sort of a social aspect for the community to come together and build software, but the purpose of the community is not necessarily for interaction so much as it is to create code or, or develop software. You can certainly have repositories and projects on GitHub that only have one person uh, as the developer and maintainer. I have many of them. Uh, so is the chief goal for GitHub about social interaction? I think the answer is no. So GitHub probably isn't counted or, or in some sense is not your general good example of a social media platform. In fact, when we talk about GitHub and Wikipedia, uh, these generally get referred to as peer production platforms, where peer production refers to a way of producing goods and services that relies on self-organized communities of individuals. So people coming together for a, a common goal, not necessarily about, about social interaction. So if we look Elsewhere, we have other kinds of definitions. What else might we say? So we say it's channels for sharing user-generated content. Um, but what does that mean? So what are the implications there? So email. Email is definitely a form of or a channel for sharing user-generated content. Ostensibly, I'm writing my own emails. I don't have a ghostwriter who writes emails for me. Does that make email social media content? Uh, potentially, to some degree, you could make that argument. If you reach way back for AOL or AOL Instant Messenger, where people are sharing chat messages in the same in the similar kind of way than you do with uh, WhatsApp or WeChat or these kinds of chat platforms or, or Facebook Messenger. Are these social media platforms? To some degree, they might be. Uh, you're certainly creating content. There's less of a chat room aspect in AIM, where there was in AOL, uh, but there's still a social aspect here, and you're again, ostensibly writing your own your own messages. So these is kind of a blur the line about what, what it means to be social media. And then we get even more complicated. So if we're talking about user-generated content as one of the key parts of, of social media, how do we deal with YouTube? Where you can have highly democratized video production, so you get random people creating YouTube videos. I have several YouTube videos on my channel. So that's definitely user-generated content. I'm a user of YouTube and I'm creating content. Uh, but you have a whole spectrum of sort of professionalism in, in YouTube. So Fort9 is a great channel I look at for motorcycle information. Uh, it's probably more like my channel uh, than say BBC is, but BBC News has its own YouTube channel. And that's definitely high production value, professional content creators, uh, from traditional media sources. So is that really considered user-generated content? So then you get into these sort of complicated places where is all content on YouTube social media content? Uh, is, social, is, is YouTube a social media platform when some of the content on the platform may not be what you'd consider social media? As this, it becomes complicated, right? So if you think about this and, and are frustrated about why is he telling us all the different corner cases to social media or what is social media, that's a legitimate, a legitimate issue that we have to deal with. This is why I first talk about defining social media. To go back to give us an answer to this question about what is social media, uh, a general kind of argument that people make is social media is a social networking site. In fact, Dana Boyd and Nicole Ellison have a nice clear definition of what a social networking site is, where a social networking site is a web-based service that allows people to basically create some kind of profile, whether it's public or semi-public, private uh, as well. You can have private profiles that uh, 
well, the existence of the profile might be known, so in some sense it's semi-public, uh, but you have a profile of some form. And then you have some list of users that share a connection. Now, is that connection about friends? Is that about being friends? Is that connection about a shared interest? It's not entirely clear what that connection uh, is just from this definition, which is good. That gives you some flexibility here. But there has got to be some sort of network involved, which makes sense. It's why it's a social networking site. And then you have to be able to view or look at the list of these connections and see what your friends or what these other people who have connections what they themselves are connected to. So that gives you the networking structure. And this public profile or semi-public profile aspect gives you the social component. So here's all these, here's a nice definition for a social networking site. But in the conversation that we've just had, it should be clear to you that social media is more than just these social networking sites. So YouTube does have to some degree a profile. Uh, but now YouTube primarily has these aspects of channels. You can have, I and as, as an individual may have multiple channels. Uh, each one of these multiple, or each one of these channels, do they correspond to profiles? Probably not. Um, same thing with Reddit. Reddit has different communities or community structures. And I may have my own Reddit user page, but that doesn't necessarily mean I have a profile, certainly not something that I have that I have described as such or am willing to like share with other people. I don't have friends in the network that then people can go and uh, view or sort of track in the way that you can with Instagram or Facebook that are sort of defined by the network. And then you have other, other spaces like Yik Yak, which is a now defunct anonymous platform where people could share content uh, with other people who were geographically proximate to them. And it turns out that certainly has no sort of social networking aspect in the sense of friends, since it's all anonymous, it's designed to not have that kind of connection. Uh, but it does still provide this sort of interaction capability. So it's clearly a, a channel for communicating socially and potentially sharing information. 4chan is sort of its own space. Uh, it's ephemeral like Snapchat. Things that you post there go away. It's all meant for people to interact uh, with the content and sort of engage and post comments in the on the content, but it's definitely not uh, network oriented. There's not a, a network structure as such because most of the accounts that that post on 4chan are, are meant to be anonymous. Uh, you can have an anonymous sort of ID that you uh, claim, but you don't have a network structure or a sort of friend or follower structure that you may have in these other platforms. And then you have things that are on the boundaries between social networking sites and social media. So like TikTok definitely has this kind of, of profile aspect where you can have friends who you can message and you can see their friends and you can uh, follow new people. But the core affordance of the TikTok platform, and we'll talk about what affordances mean uh, in, a later, in a later video, where affordance is basically what sort of functionality does a platform give you. The main affordance for TikTok is this recommendation algorithm that shows you new content. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a friend or network involved in TikTok in order to have the algorithm that runs TikTok learn what kind of content you want to see and feed you that content. So the core purpose of the, of the TikTok platform is probably more about consuming media and engaging with people who posted a video and less about the networking aspect. Likewise with Twitch, you have a much more sort of one-to-many broadcasting audience uh, or broadcasting kind of platform that's more similar to YouTube, but it does have a networking aspect. You can have friends, these kinds of things, uh, but it's much more about broadcast. So it's still social in that people are, are, can engage with the broadcasters, but it's less about the network aspect because these broadcasters are sort of not peers to the rest of the, the of their audience. Though in some sense they can be because you can be a, an audience member in, in one stream and then a streamer in another and then stream your own content. So there's definitely blurred lines here. So the definition that we'll use throughout the class is this one from Carr and Hayes uh, from 2015 that I, I, I like. So certainly there's, there's no consensus in the definition of what is social media. Um, people use social networking sites and social media sort of synonymously, which I just, the graph I just showed you should, should, should suggest that that's wrong uh, or that that's at least incomplete. But this is, this is what I, I think I've settled on as a nice definition, that social media are internet-based channels that allow users to opportunistically interact and selectively self-present, either in real time or asynchronously, uh, 
with broad and narrow audiences, and who derive value from user-generated content and the perception of interactions with others. So the internet-based channels gives us what's got to be online in some way. It allows people to interact and self-promote or self-present, but do so selectively so people can sort of audit their self-presentation. It can be like real-time streaming or real-time interaction uh, like WhatsApp or Snapchat or asynchronous like Facebook or Reddit or YouTube or somewhere in between. Uh, in fact, Twitter's whole shtick is about what's happening right now. So it's more about uh, real-time sort of content uh, consumption than it is about posting something, somebody's tweets or reading somebody's tweets from several years ago. Instagram is a similar. In fact, it's it, a norm of the platform on Instagram is not to go back and like people's images from several years ago that, that has a particular sort of label or behavior associated with that that is uh, generally frowned upon. But the core piece is that people have audiences and the value of the content posted on social media platforms or posted through social media channels is user generated. And that the people who get to interact with that content is one of the core values of the platform. Now again, you know, what is BBC's role on YouTube as a professional uh, image house or a professional uh, media channel? Definitely blurs these lines that, that we would potentially have to deal with. But I think it's close enough to be able to say this is a good definition of what social media is. So now you might ask, why do we need to study it? Well, I'll, give you through, I'll run you through a number of different reasons here. Uh, the first is that there are many social media sites, and in fact, many social media sites are, actually, are exceedingly popular. Uh, so in the United States, as of 2018, more than two-thirds of Americans use Facebook, and almost three-quarters of Americans are on YouTube or consume YouTube content. And that's a pretty significant number of, of, of the population. And if we look globally, in terms of who uses social networking sites, this is like just social networks, not necessarily social media. We're talking about half the population of the planet, and that includes people who are not on the internet. So this is a pretty staggering number that many people on, on the in the globe are on these kinds of platforms. Uh, some good stat statistics that sort of show how crazy this is. Every minute of every day on YouTube, we're talking about 500 hours of content are uploaded. So we're creating way more content on these social media platforms or in these social media spaces than any person could consume. And this kind of, of availability or interest in social media is not specific to the United States, though in Twitter we see the U.S. is the number one source of Twitter users, but it's definitely international, with Japan having almost as many Twitter users as the U.S., followed by India, Brazil, the U.K., uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia. So we're talking about numerous continents, uh, though you have to go down to about Egypt before you start to see Africa, but we're talking about most most continents have pretty significant uh, engagement on places like Twitter. And on Facebook, it's quite different, where now instead of the U.S. being the number one source, you have India as the number one source. There are almost more people uh, on Facebook in India than there are people in the United States, full stop. Uh, so this shows you that Facebook is way more popular than Twitter globally. So it's not just a, but it's not just a question of many people use these platforms. So so that sort of provides value in of itself or asks interesting questions. When we're talking about the world today and how the world has to engage with COVID nineteen, what does that mean for these online social platforms? When people can't engage socially in person they naturally are going to turn to other ways of engaging socially, meaning social media sites or social media platforms which provide channels for people to engage and get that interaction. And in fact, there's a lot of interesting question about how social media is, is helping the world cope with COVID-19 as a pandemic. Uh, so this paper on the left that I show you, the impact of social media on panic during the COVID-19 pandemic in, in Iraq or Iraqi Kurdistan, so their main result is Facebook is, or social media is not a good space for this. Uh, they look primarily at Facebook. Facebook is one of the more popular platforms, or the most popular platform in Iraqi Kurdistan. And what they find is a lot of, of panic and misinformation and negative feeling is, 
uh, sourced from Facebook. And yet people use this platform to engage very heavily now and they can engage in person. And the Center for De Disease Control and Prevention in the United States has its own social media toolkit. There are all kinds of questions about what role does social media play during these massive global crises. And the negative or the negative consequences that come with that. So since we're still grappling with how we contend with uh, misinformation and low quality information on these spaces, this means that we have to deal with things like people dying from misinformation that they read on social media, thinking that they're safe or thinking that that a particular uh, home remedy may protect them or help keep them healthy when the reality is that it won't. What does that mean for people? How do we deal with this, this issue? This is technological because it's built on techn technological platforms, but it's also social. It's a very clear social socio-technical system that we have to deal with as technologists about how do we handle these kinds of questions. And the, the impact that social media has had on politics cannot be understated, especially now in, in the aftermath of the 2016 election and lead up to the 2020 election. Um, social media has a, a really strong role in how people engage politically. So what does this mean? And what are some examples of this? In the early 2010s, uh, the world was very different. And in fact, social media sites like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube were seen as, as democratizing forces or agents of democracy globally, especially in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, where a number of uh, more authoritarian governments were challenged by popular protests that were sort of coordinated by and on users of these platforms, leading us to ask questions about cyber activism and what is the role of these kinds of new media platforms. But the world changed pretty quickly. And now we have a different view where uh, social media in, in social media countries in the late 20, 2010s, so 2016 and beyond, uh, has a much darker, has shown to have a much darker role. And how we deal with this is an open question. There's a really good paper from Hunt Alcott and others from Stanford and NYU where they looked at if we pay people to stay off social media, or especially, uh, specifically Facebook, how does that impact their well-being? And one of the things they find is that people who stayed off of Facebook or were paid to stay off Facebook uh, reported increases in well-being. They were happier in general, but they were less politically informed or felt less politically informed. Uh, so these platforms provide value in, ter in terms of political informedness, but at the cost of, of unhappiness. How do we balance these things? That, may not be a, techn a technological question, but it's definitely a question that people who are developing these platforms should contend with. Now, while people are less happy being on these platforms and are more politically informed by being on these platforms, uh, these platforms have also, also given space for really important social movements to evolve, like the hashtag MeToo movement or the Black Lives Matter movement. The Black Lives Matter formed or was created online uh, in 2013 and didn't see significant uptick until the popular demonstrations in Ferguson in 2014. And more recently with the murder of George Floyd, where many people use this hashtag as a way to coordinate significant popular demonstrations about police brutality in the United States. And from a social movement perspective, these are, these are definitely pro-social things uh, where people are getting out, mobilizing and engaging in, in, uh, demonstration to communicate their political goals. At the same time, there's a darker side that we have to deal with in terms of Gamergate and how these social media platforms potentially amplify and broadcast uh, very fringe or, or radically left and radically right kinds of content. Uh, and what does that mean when these platforms allow people to engage globally? and engage globally in an anonymous way and become very popular for sharing uh, what is arguably extremely anti-social content. At the same time, there's uh, an age component here where the younger generations are often seen as politically disengaged, uh, much less so than, than the older generations who uh, generally are, are more likely to vote. But when you have platforms like TikTok uh, that 
push a lot of engagement as it's as one of the main affordances of the recommendation algorithm of the platform. Some more recent work out of Penn State from Guana de Uvado and, and Munger is really good talking about how young people are using TikTok as sort of a, a cable news platform and engaging very heavily with left and right leaning political content, at least in the United States. And that's sort of all kind of organic uses of the platform, but certainly there's a, a whole other space and uses of these social media platforms for trying to influence popular perceptions. We saw this in 2016 with the Russian Internet Research Agency, uh, where in the aftermath of the 2016 election, where the IRA actively worked to undermine uh, US, the U.S. presidential election and tried to or actively supported Donald Trump in his election, the result of this was uh, an, in, an indictment by the U.S. Department of Justice against 12 Russian nationals for uh, interfering in, in the U.S. political system, where Russian agents acting as though or, or uh, trying to appear as though they were American sources uh, or U.S. citizens used many online platforms from Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, uh, podcast channels and the like to further their their political goals in a very inauthentic way. Uh, the platforms are trying to contend with this. So Twitter has its election integrity and transparency data sets where they're trying to make this content available so researchers can, can research it or study it because these are really important questions for today uh, with talking about 4,000 or more accounts that are affiliated with these kinds of, of organizations. And certainly Russia is not the only or the only country uh, responsible for this. A recent study from the Oxford Internet Institute found that uh, 70 countries across the globe have, are actively engaging in some sort of online influence campaign. But these are really hard questions that we have to answer about if you have some population online using these social media platforms as the vast almost the vast majority of online internet users are, uh, what are the roles of bots in, in these discussions, especially politi political discussions? What are the roles of sock puppets that are pretending to be one account uh, or pretending to be somebody but are actually controlled by another account? Or troll accounts that uh, pretend to be or masquerade themselves as, as legitimate actors who engaging in a political system when they're actually actively trying to undermine that system? These are all hard questions that uh, I think should be addressed. Moving away from politics, though, and as sort of a segue between the politics and Facebook study from Al Catadol to how people feel after their use uh, for using social media, there's a lot of open questions about social media and well-being. So this is slightly political or sort of a, as I said, a segue from the political aspect uh, as the Internet increasingly is adopted in less developed countries, these social media platforms come to them and becomes kind of synonymous with uh, internet usage. So Facebook, when it first came to Myanmar, it was very, I mean, what is the line between the internet and Facebook? Uh, when basically all internet resources in Myanmar might be, might run through Facebook in the same way that you may think the internet is generally uh, accessible through Google. What we find from this is that uh, Facebook has admitted to being a part, uh, party to uh, a genocide in Myanmar, uh, which is a terrible thing that this social media platform has uh, been used this way. Did Mark Zuckerberg envision this when he originally used or created Facebook? You know, maybe not. Probably not. One would hope not. But it is now a consequence that we have to deal with. Uh, as I mentioned, YouTube is exceedingly popular, but recently it's gotten flack for its ability to potentially radicalize uh, populations who are maybe more vulnerable uh, to going down what's called the YouTube rabbit hole and ending up in these sort of alternative information spaces uh, full of conspiracy and, and fringe information. So this is a piece by Zenep Tufeki where she talks about this. This was followed up by Kevin Roos uh, almost a year later, uh, talking about this is a story of a particular person who became a YouTube radical. And in fact, there's 
been studies about the extreme right and how these communities have sort of colonized uh, YouTube that have been under study since uh, 2013. As I mentioned, these platforms are trying to address these issues, like YouTube trying to address how its platform gets used to share misinformation and, and hate speech. But that has an important question or set of questions for us as researchers or for us as academics. When YouTube talks about its four R's of responsibility, uh, really what is the impact of these actions on the larger information, information space? Does YouTube's uh, rewarding quote unquote trusted and eligible creators uh, and reducing the spread of, of content that uh, brushes against their policies as they say, does that really increase the quality of online information? I think that's a really important question that we have to, to wrestle with. Because if you look in the United States, uh, almost half of the population has experienced some sort of uh, harassment in these online spaces, in social, especially in social media. And if we ask questions about, well, what is the impact of that? Uh, it turns out that almost a quarter of young adults in the United States experience some sort of significant uh, emotional distress as a result of these kinds of behaviors. And this can, is even compounded in the aftermath of crises where people may turn to these social media platforms for engagement uh, and interaction only to be met with vitriol about conspiracies about crisis actors. Uh, this is often seen after the Sandy Hook massacre or the Parkland shooting, uh, these baseless accusations that the people involved were crisis actors. All of this has been debunked, and yet these kinds of, of conspiracies pop up in the aftermath of the vast majority of these sort of uh, man-made or, or in, in some cases, natural disasters. But it's not to say that all social media is bad. Uh, one of the things we've, we've learned from studying the aftermath of, of disasters on social media is that uh, there are consistent responses to these kinds of events, and one of which is massive outpouring of, of sentiment with comments about thoughts and prayers and uh, well wishes to the people affected by these disasters. So much so there is research from Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland looking at how social media and expressions of gratitude are valuable avenues for social support in the aftermath of disaster. Also during disasters and moments of, of disruption and unrest, social media platforms have a lot of important and useful information. As I mentioned, during demonstrations, people use social media to coordinate or to share information about hazards uh, or to share information in the aftermath of, of disaster. So uh, here on the bottom left, within two minutes of the Boston Marathon bombing occurring in 2013, people were sharing information about exactly where that explosion had happened, so this explosion on Boston Street. Uh, that's important situational awareness information that we can mine uh, immediately, which is valuable when you don't necessarily have boots on the ground. Uh, to study these kinds of things. Same thing in the aftermath of, of natural disasters or man-made disasters. People share information that's valuable for emergency responders. And all this is valuable, but also, again, we have to deal with quality issues. So uh, I include this, this, option, or this image here of a shark swimming down a highway uh, that's been flooded because in the aftermath, like the crisis actor, example before, in the aftermath of these kinds of events, people often share misinformation uh, that they find engaging. So in the aftermath of basically every hurricane uh, that causes widespread flooding, you'll see this, this image. It happened in Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Irma, and I'm sure we'll see it in other places as well. And then I've already talked about the ethical issues that come up in, in dealing with social media content and doing studies on social media. What, is, what does this mean? How do we deal with questions about uh, informed consent and who has rights to use this data and who has agency over how it should be used? These are all important questions that all have implications for the public and for the economy when data is now more valuable than oil. So I hopefully have given you a number of different avenues where social media has really important questions that are deserving of study, from well-being to politics to social movements to crises to ethical issues. There are many questions here that, that need answers, and hopefully in this class you'll get something out about how we can answer these questions.
So the last thing I'll talk about is how we study social media. Uh, in this class, the main way we'll do this is through APIs, which gives us some manage manner of approved access to these platforms. So we can extract content, uh, engage with users, potentially extract networks, these kinds of things uh, in an approved way or a way that's at least consistent with the terms of service of these platforms and in a programmatic way, which will be helpful. But sometimes APIs aren't enough. Uh, Twitter in particular is API is known for having uh, pretty significant rate limits. So while Twitter has been a uh, massively important so source for studies for computational social science and studies of social media, uh, it may not be enough. And you've seen academics or you may see academics developing these kinds of platforms like Twint or the Twitter open source intelligence tool uh, that's written in Python and designed to scrape the twitter.com website rather than relying on Twitter's API. In fact, it actually it actively circumvents Twitter's API, which opens up questions about are these kinds of scrapers and the resulting terms of service violations ethical uses of the data or ethical ways to access this data. But sometimes it's the only way to get this data. So for TikTok, while TikTok does have an API, it's an increasingly important uh, source of information, especially during the 2020 presidential election. And its APIs don't give a huge amount of information about how the platform is used and how information is shared on the platform. So uh, there is an undocumented API that the app has to use to collect this information. Can we use it as well uh, in a sort of scraping kind of way, or can we scrape the TikTok.com website? Sometimes there's no other uh, legitimate way to get the data, and then you have to deal with the ethical issues that come from this. Social media is also a good place for uh, recruitment, for other kinds of more engaged studies with individuals, uh, either through gamification or uh, advertising, uh, or straight just asking people on social media to uh, take your survey or, or participate in some experiment. There are ethical issues uh, with that. That's things that we have to deal with. And there are other interesting ways to get data. So in, in any sort of online channel where people are engaging with content, you have uh, potentially many, many, many gigabytes of log data where people are clicking on links and then uh, sending Git requests through your server to access information. And if you can log all this information, you can capture some really impressive insights about how many people are viewing a particular tweet, uh, really who has the influence of that tweet for important questions like exposure to misinformation and disinformation or exposure to fake news. Uh, unfortunately for social media platforms, this data is often highly sensitive and uh, very protected, so we generally don't have access to this data unless you go work at Facebook or do an internship there, or do an internship at Twitter, which is something that you could do. Uh, but we won't really use this method uh, in this class. So in terms of the modules or the, the way this class is structured, so we've just talked about module one. Hopefully I've given you some reasons why you should care about social media. Module two, we'll talk about how we're collecting social media Modules three, four, and five are going to talk about how we extract important insights from these social media platforms to answer some of the questions that I've, that I've described. Module six will talk about how these platforms and the networks that are on them have evolved and how we can uh, use the temporal dynamics of these platforms to understand real-world events, which has implications for all the other modules. Module 7, we'll talk about some of the more antisocial, darker sides of social media that I discussed, things like online harassment, misinformation, disinformation, these kinds of things. And then finally, Module 8, we'll talk about the economics of social media. So what behaviors do particular affordances of these platforms uh, really incentivize? It's important for understanding essentially all other things uh, in this space uh, when we're talking about people making hundreds of millions of dollars off these platforms or influencers and content creators making million millions of dollars a year, potentially sharing highly engaging but maybe very wrong uh, or incorrect or harmful information. Uh, what kind of incentives exist in these spaces? All right, well, hopefully I've given you some insight into 
what social media is, why it's important, and how we'll deal with it. Uh, if you have any questions, post them in the discussion forums.